Ricky from Kunov and the Hello. Hello. So, uh, some of you, by looking at uh, this title, may have thought that uh, uh, Pablo got uh, hit by a vicious, uh, or was an ambitious title. Uh, so, probably you've uh, put on your alarm clock today very early just to see myself uh, make a foolish of myself. But, uh, not at all, this title is uh, just a slight modification of uh, the title of the paper by Robin Gandhi which was a PhD student of uh, Alan Turing and uh, the only thing we've done is really take that title and add the word quantum into it. So in fact our working title was a quantum version of Gandhi's theorem. Now uh, of course uh, perhaps uh, most of you don't know what Gandhi's theorem is so uh, if we had put that title we probably wouldn't have put your alarm clock. So, so what is this about? Well, so that picture here is a Turing machine, so you surely all know what a Turing machine is, but probably you never noticed how similar it looks to a coffee machine. <laughs> <laughs> so this talk will be about the church Turing thesis. The church Turing thesis says that Anything that can be computed can be computed by such a machine. Now, because we are uh, safely uh, oriented towards physics here, uh, we we'll take the physical charge Turing thesis and we we'll say that this is a statement about physics. Anything that can be computed by a physical machine uh, can be computed by a Turing machine. We we'll take that version. I want to emphasize how important this statement is to uh, computer science. It's a political statement of independence. I mean, back in the days, of course, uh, people uh, had in mind that computers were just uh, a bunch of uh, electronic devices or tubes. Or, uh, and uh, people knew that uh, computer science was a branch of physics. But, uh, when I was uh, doing my uh, studies uh, here in London, uh, I was told 200 times that uh, the important point was hardware independence and how we should be independent about all physical contingencies. Okay. So this, uh, this uh, statement here, the church sharing thesis, is really uh, a cornerstone of computer science and of our independence. However, we all know here that uh, it's been put at stake to some extent by uh, quantum computation and so the, the question is, uh, is it still really uh, holding in this uh, quantum, computation, quantum computational setting? Right. So, actually there is another version of this thesis which is the strong uh, Thesis. The strong charge Turing thesis has it that anything that can be computed by a physical system can be computed efficiently by a Turing machine. And that we sort of know that with uh, quantum computation uh, this is uh, not really the case and we've got uh, some uh, examples like a Google's algorithm where you can prove a bounds in the classical case and beat that in the, in the classical case. So I'm really interested in just what you can compute in absolute with an unbounded amount of uh, space and time resources. And uh, throughout the talk I will take this uh, uh, function h as uh, some uncomputable function. So, <coughs> machines cannot just compute anything. There are certain things that they cannot compute, like solving uh, systems uh, of equations whose solutions you know are integers, or uh, the whole thing problem, etc. So this is really a statement about limitations of physics. So 
uh, when I first uh, uh, read about quantum computation, I probably did uh, the same thing as uh, most of you and read this paper by Dutch. And in this paper, this question of whether uh, the physical charge during thesis holds is already handled in a way. So Deutsch says, uh, well, the quantum computer is really about uh, vectors of complex numbers, and matrices, unit tree evolutions that you apply to these vectors. And um, of course, you can always uh, write them down and uh, just compute uh, the matrix multiplications yourself, depending on the paper. And therefore, anything that, can, that a quantum computer can compute, a Turing machine can compute, or you can compute, uh, with pen and paper. Of course, it will take a very long time, an exponential time, but it's feasible. And therefore, um, quantum computation does not put at stake this uh, thesis. Right. Um, on the other hand, you have a more recent paper by uh, Michael Nielsen. So the second thing you might have done when entering this field is to read uh, Nielsen's book. And uh, Michael Nielsen points out that actually, if you take the postulates of quantum theory, nothing forbids that you may define some unitary uh, that computes some uncomputable function. And of course, he doesn't say that, that these uh, unitaries are easy to build in, uh, in practice, but he says. Uh, if I just take the postulates of quantum theory by the book, then nothing tells me that I cannot define a unit tree, for instance, uh, like uh, this one. So I take uh, as input some <coughs> integer, some uh, register, which has just uh, one bit, and I map that to uh, okay, the same integer and hi uh, with additional material to on b. Okay. That thing here is a permutation. It's uh, therefore unitary, and it does compute uh, h of pi. And this paper has got lots of little, plenty, little examples where um, quantum theory has little loopholes like this that lets you uh, compute uh, H, some H. So, of course, then the, the he points out that really quantum computing may be about vectors and, uh, and matrices, but quantum theory it has to be a little bit bigger <coughs> than that. And even if you want to uh, model just one particle on a real line, you're already in an uh, infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And therefore, uh, we need uh, these infinite dimensional vector spaces. And so, uh, yes, I mean, there is here a, a question whether our quantum theory can put at stake uh, the charge Turing thesis. Now, if you ask uh, Dirac what he thinks about it, probably he doesn't have an opinion about uh, the charge Turing thesis, but he has this belief that anything that quantum theory lets you define, in a way, is a feasible thing. And that if we <coughs> cannot build that in the laboratory, it's just because we are bad experimentalists, but uh, it should be feasible. Now, this is not Nielsen's opinion. This, uh, what Nielsen advocates is that what we need is to revise quantum theory slightly and have some postulates that are uh, slightly more restrictive and that will forbid such things to be defined as a physical experiment. So this is a, a kind of program that we will uh, embark on uh, this talk. So quantum theory uh, is about okay, defining states, 
upon the vector space and dynamics as operators upon this vector space. And uh, so what I will need to explain is how to define rigorously the notion of computability upon vector spaces. And then I will take uh, again these arguments and uh, modernize it and quantize it uh, a little bit. Uh, and uh, the interesting point about uh, his argument is how from uh, physics principles we can derive a statement uh, of uh, computability. <coughs> So this, this work will move towards some uh, more restrictive quantum theory that, uh, that is computable. So the notion of uh, what is a computable function is very well understood uh, on integers. I take functions from integers to integers, then I can define those who are uh, Computable by those who are computable by an intelligent integers and the Turing machine, etc. But if I just take some um, other set here, and typically for this talk we are interested in vector spaces, so if I take a vector space here, uh, there is no clear definition a priori of uh, what is a computable function from a vector space to a vector space. So, what you can do in general in order to transport, translate this notion of computability is to uh, define a, a mapping, an indexing of the set that you are interested in into the integers. So, <coughs> what I mean by that is that if you have a countable set, then you can uh, number your items in the set here, and you will say that the function phi from e to e is computable if, when I take the natural number representation of uh, these elements, there is a computable function from integers to integers that <coughs> implements phi. Okay. So, these things need to be defined carefully, and this is a bunch of properties that this index needs, needs to have, but uh, that's not uh, crucial for this book. Now, if you do this, you have a slight problem. Because this way of defining computability over E is in fact very unstable, very ambiguous. Because depending on the way you choose to index the elements of E, <coughs> you may arrive at uh, very different notions of what is computable over E. And in fact, typically, uh, if I take uh, an indexing function that is uh, uncomputable, so let me compose I with another indexing function H, and H will be uh, chosen uh, uncomputable, then doing this will completely change. Uh, <coughs> I mean, uh, you know, asking that phi is computable means what? Asking that this is computable or that is computable. And, and these are two very different things, so you're really changing completely what you mean by a computable function of our vector spaces. Say. So how can you solve that uh, problem? Well, um, <coughs> it has been noted in uh, previous works that, of course, this set here, vector space, is say, they rarely come in uh, isolation. They come with some operations. For instance, uh, addition between vectors, etc. And so, what you may want is to restrict the set of possible indexings, the indexings that you allow, so that they respect some of the structure here. So for instance, if there is an addition, if you, in 
your set, you just want that uh, the corresponding operation on the uh, natural number representation of these vectors has to be a computable function of n to n. Okay? And that way, you are killing off a great number of um, uh, indexings. And sometimes, if, you, if your set is well structured by the operations, if your algebraic structure is complete in a sense, uh, then that definition of uh, admissible indexing will lead to a unique notion of computability. That is, if you take uh, only indexings that respect uh, this condition, that the operations be computable, then uh, that's it. You've, uh, you've uh, uniquely defined computability. So we've been studying that precise issue for vector spaces. And uh, go to a certain uh, number of results which are here, to the right. <coughs> so, the first result is that if you take a field which has a stable computability, <coughs> then you can consider an algebraic structure which is bigger, which is uh, the vector space over that uh, field. We find that we proved that this has a stable computability if and only if the dimension of the vector space is finite. That is, uh, if this vector space is infinite, you're in trouble. You have too many possible indexings, and, 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 uh, and so you can no longer uh, define computability through the integral numbers. So you could say, oh, this is, uh, this is useless because, um, you know, uh, back to my first slide, uh, Nielsen's point was really that, you know, quantum theory is about uh, infinite dimensional uh, vector spaces. And so if we want to say something non-trivial here, we, we need to be able to handle computability about those. Okay. But it, it's not that bad because, first of all, what you can do is notice that the rational numbers, Q, uh, if you equip them with a plus and uh, multiplication, they are uh, a stable, uh, they have a stable computability. And so what you can do here is do a finite extension of Q. You just add the imaginary number, square root of Q. And what you have already is that uh, the natural field to do uh, quantum computation is, uh, the numbers that you get in your Hadamard and C0 and, uh, and the compositions of uh, these things, uh, well, this, this is a field with a stable computability. Okay, so we've done the field. Now let's do the vector space. So what we've got here is that, okay, in finite dimensional vector spaces do not have a stable computability. But if we structure them further, that is, if we actually say that this infinite dimensional vector space is really one that is made out of tensoring uh, to get um, a finite dimensional vector space, then this algebraic structure here, together with the tensor, has stable computability. Right, so that was the more uh, sort of Komsky part of the, the computability part of the talk. Uh, for uh, those who haven't understood uh, the detail, let's just say that we have a rigorous, solid definition of what is computable in these, uh, in these uh, vector spaces. Now, uh, let's turn the focus towards uh, Gandhi's proof of the charge string thesis. So, Gandhi, uh, so as I say, the PhD student of Alan Turing, uh, decided to beat his uh, master and uh, actually make the, the charge string thesis a theorem. Now, uh, of course, he needed some uh, hypothesis to do that. 
and uh, he just tried to look at really plausible facts about physics, formalize them into a mathematical hypothesis, and really just derive uh, the charge showing thesis from that. <coughs> so these hypotheses are here. Let me introduce a bit of notation. This capital A is just uh, to denote a region of space. This big sigma of A is uh, the state space of A. Uh, rho of A is the state, so an element of uh, sigma of A. And G is some discrete time evolution that will take you from time t to time uh, t plus uh, dt. So, what is widely believed is that uh, the rules of physics are the same uh, everywhere in space. And in fact, it wouldn't be much use if I uh, find the great thing about physics uh, here in Oxford uh, is it doesn't apply in New York. So, the way he captures that is by saying that, uh, well, first of all, the state space of a region A is the same as the state space of the, of, uh, the region translated. And second of all, the evolution, the, the dynamics commutes with translation. Well, the second thing is that uh, the laws of physics do not change in time. Okay. Again, it would be a bit uh, disappointing if you have to revise uh, physics. So, a, a more, uh, a less trivial assumption is bound the density of information. So this, uh, this postulate, this hypothesis about physics, says that uh, if you take a finite volume of uh, space, then it can only contain a finite amount of information. That's something that you don't really read in, uh, in physics textbooks. But if you do an opinion poll amongst uh, physicists, they tend to believe that this is true, at least under a hypothesis of, uh, of bounded energy. But uh, then they also believe that there is an infinite amount of energy. So, okay, so that's that's a, a, a important assumption. <coughs> then uh, this assumption is just bounded speed of information. And the way to formalize it is to say that. The state of a region A at the next time step is a function of the state of A and its neighbors at the previous step. Okay? And finally, we will uh, make the assumption that uh, there is only, um, well, that we live in a finite universe. Not a bounded universe, but a, a finite universe. So, from this hypothesis, you can uh, prove the charge shrink thesis. Uh, this is what's funny about it. The proof is not so fun, actually. The proof is, uh, is quite simple. It is relatively simple. The, the idea is just this. You say, well, let me cut space into cubes. Okay? And I'll take one, at, one way to cut that is more or less... Uh, translation invariant. So here there is a maybe some assumption about a certain flatness of space, but you don't mind that. Let's cut space into cubes. And uh, then let me consider uh, the state space of A. So we call that sigma A. So applying the homogeneity of space hypothesis, then the state space of B must be the same as that of sigma A, and moreover, applying the bounded density hypothesis, <coughs> this set should be finite, and so this set is just a finite set which we will call S. Now, second of all, let's apply the quiescent uh, hypothesis which says that there is only a finite number of, uh, of these uh, tubes that contain something of interest. 
the rest is just uh, in some uh, trivial extent. <coughs> now let me apply the homogeneity of, the homogeneity of time and hypothesis. That tells me that to evolve from for, from a time t to t plus t, well, the little t here has no importance. <coughs> That's just the G that will take me uh, from one time step to another. Okay. And finally, let me apply the bounded speed of information hypothesis. And what that says is that uh, <coughs> I can compute the state of this set by applying a function to um, the neighboring cells at the previous time step. Right? And moreover, if I apply the. the okay. Uh, before that, uh, yes. I can notice that since uh, each cell has a state space which is just S, which is a finite set, then of course uh, this function F is a function from finite sets to finite sets. Okay? Here there are, at the bottom there are 9 cells, so that's s to the 9 uh, to s. So a function from finite sets to finite sets, it's always uh, computable, because you can just uh, uh, have the table of the function and just uh, look up the result. And, uh, and therefore, um, f is computable, and moreover, by uh, the homogeneity of space hypothesis again, uh, this f is the same one everywhere. So now, that's it, because uh, if I want to compute uh, this big evolution G, well, I just have to apply this little f everywhere, and, uh, and there is only a finite number of places where I need to apply it, because there is only a finite number of cells that are of interest, the other ones are quiescent, and, uh, and so that's it, I've got that G is a uh, Okay, so that's the, the classical proof, uh, the Gandhi proof of uh, the charge theory thesis. So, what, what we like about this proof is that it's got really this idea that um, physics principle, and in particular causality, bounded speed of information, can buy you uh, computability. Now, of course, there are lots of things that can be criticized about uh, this, uh, this proof. For instance, uh, the fact that the state space of, uh, of a region of space is finite. Of course, for us, uh, we know about quantum theory. We will find that uh, absurd. We know that uh, a qubit, uh, just a qubit, is already in a, in a <coughs> set which, uh, which is infinite. Okay? continuity of the qubit, so you really can't say that. And moreover, there was a few more assumptions that could have been, uh, that might have been shocking. For instance, this fact that <coughs> at some point you compute a cell, and then you compute the other, and you compute the other, etc. And you say, okay, I'm finished. But in quantum theory, it's not like that. It's not because you know uh, the different parts states that you know the entire state because there are many entanglement correlations etc and, and you need to, um, to to tell what they are okay. so what we did is we okay, we did our best to try and extend uh, Gandhi's postulate to account for our quantum theory and uh, the modifications are the green ones so for bounded density of information, <coughs> we changed that to uh, sigma a, the finite dimensional vector space, over the finite extension of the rational numbers. Okay, so you have to imagine that you know, every finite volume of space is a, uh, you know, a, a finite number of qubits, uh, but not over arbitrary complex numbers, 
but uh, just the ones that you would uh, meet if you were uh, applying just your Hadama or the Fairy thing. So a dense, definitely a dense uh, subset of the complex numbers. Uh, and the other modification that we did was, okay, just to say that uh, the evolution has to be unitary. Okay, that's just to, to be in line with uh, quantum theory. Uh, now, the notations are uh, the same, but you have to watch out that rho now, okay, it's the state of, uh, of a region, the state of A, but of course you know that because there is entanglement, so you can't really speak of, of the state of a subsystem. Well, yes, you can, and you have to use the reduced density uh, matrix formalism for that. So these are really just uh, density matrices uh, a la von Neumann. Right. So let's see how, uh, how we can uh, prove the charge hypothesis from this hypothesis. So really the, okay, the proof starts very much the same. I mean, you cut the space into cube, uh, you look at uh, each cell, you say, okay, it's, uh, it is in a finite dimensional vector space, moreover, it's the same for every cell, etc. So let's, let's go to the, interesting um, modifications of the proof. So, as I say, at some point in the proof, we had this, that you say uh, the evolution is uh, causal, I mean information doesn't propagate too fast, therefore I can compute the reduced density matrix of this cell as a function of the reduced density matrix of the neighboring cells at the previous time step. And earlier on, I was just uh, saying, okay, now I extrapolate to all the cells and I'm finished. But now I can't do that, so what can I do? And here is uh, the moment where we uh, just uh, invoke some uh, earlier results that we had with uh, Reinhard Werner and uh, Vincent Lem, <coughs> which tells you that if you have a unitary and causal operator, so let me emphasize that G is really something that takes loads of little quantum systems and gives you back loads of quantum systems. It's a big, infinite dimensional unitary operator, but it's causal. Information does not propagate too fast. It respects the light code. Okay. If you have these things, then the theorem has it that you can decompose G into local unitary operations that uh, apply uh, only on the neighboring cells. <coughs> so, uh, what I mean is that Okay, a natural way to uh, define a unitary causal uh, operator is by a circuit, uh, a circuit of gates that apply locally uh, in, uh, in a finite, finite depth. <laughs> and what this theorem says is that it's the only way to do it. And, uh, and therefore, we can uh, presume, we know from the theorem that G admits a decomposition here, where you have a first layer where you apply some, uh, some matrix, I mean some local uh, unit operation over neighborhoods, and you do that uh, everywhere in the first layer, and then you have a second layer which is the same one but slightly shifted, and basically it just says that it's a, it's a circuit a quantum circuit of finite depth. Okay. Now, well, and it's infinite in, uh, in space, right? I mean, uh, here I'm uh, confined on, on every cell. <coughs> so, <coughs> what you next do is you apply the quiescence hypothesis. You say, well, these uh, 
local unitaries that, that compose uh, my, uh, they, that produce my G, I don't really need to apply them everywhere. I can just apply them on the region of interest. Uh, okay. And finally, you need a technical lemma which tells you that, uh, that local linear maps, <coughs> so remember that we are really working in a, some algebraic structure, which is a, a vector space with uh, tensor products, etc. We showed that this had stable computability, and we can prove that local linear maps, so these little uh, m and l here, uh, they are computable. In a way, it's, it's like applying a matrix somewhere. And uh, so therefore, you have proved uh, that uh, G as a composition of, uh, as a finite composition of computable uh, functions is itself a computable function. So the, our game was to, uh, you take all the hypotheses but one, and you try to find the counterexample of the theorem. So you take all the hypotheses but homogeneity of space, and then you get a counterexample to the church ring thesis, and just to, to have an intuition of this, you have to imagine that you, you live in a world where our physics laws are not quite the same uh, in different places. And so the idea would be that uh, if I walk uh, high meters towards the left, then here there is some uh, f physical phenomenon that tells me whether the uh, high Turing machine uh, holds on it. Okay. So I could encode uh, the result of uncomputable function in the dishomogeneity of, uh, of physics laws in space. So for uh, the homogeneity of time hypothesis, its necessity comes from very much the same kind of argument. You just have to wait uh, i seconds before uh, suddenly uh, from the sky uh, you get told uh, whether the i Turing machine goes on. For the bound density of information hypothesis, uh, that, that's a bit more interesting. So really, the, of course, the theorem works by structuring space, cutting it into, into pieces. And, and so then, because information doesn't go too fast, then the things that happen between those pieces is relatively simple. Now, if you, th if you say that information can go as fast as it can, then it, it's no use to have cut those things into pieces. You just you still have access to a, a big set at the same time, and you, and you can do uh, you can very easily encode. Uh, uh. <coughs> so, but uh, an even more interesting uh, thing is why have we uh, taken care of taking a subset of the complex numbers and not uh, just uh, all the complex numbers? And here there is a a counterexample which is due to Nielsen, which is that if you imagine a, a little gate, little quantum gate that takes k0 into a superposition of uh, 0 and 1, but with some amplitudes that hide an uh, uncomputable number, then you can use tomography to extract little by little this uh, uncomputable number, and so you will get access to H. So that's kind of probabilistic uh, algorithm, but it's already uh, super, <coughs> super Turing. Uh, okay, uh, that's what I wanted to say about this slide. So let me come to uh, the conclusions. So. Uh, Gandhi had this, uh, 
this nice idea that you could have uh, physics symmetries to derive the charge to infinities. So we did a quantum extension of that. Nielsen had these other ideas that um, that we should uh, well that the charge to infinities is almost a symmetry of physics, or at least that we need to formulate uh, in a in a physically uh, uh, okay, motivated manner, uh, the postulates of quantum theory, so that the charge theory thesis uh, holds. And we, we've done some of that. Uh, <coughs> why just some of that? Well, because we haven't spoken, for instance, of, uh, of measurements. Uh, we left them completely out of the picture. So one uh, direction of future work would be to try and consider a notion of uh, an observable that wouldn't break everything, so a notion of reasonable observable, perhaps, that, uh, that would maintain computability. So that, that, that may not be so, so easy. Uh, there is this uh, question of bounded density here. So there is, there is something that... Um, okay, that, that's something that we need to as physicists about, I mean, whether they, they can model uh, their experiments with uh, this hypothesis of uh, bounded density or not. Uh, but there are other things, other violent things that we've done. I mean, uh, for instance, uh, it was very clear that at some point we just said, okay, let me cut space into cubes, and that could be a, a bit uh, problematic. Uh, for instance, can we really encode isotropic phenomena uh, when you cut space into cubes like this? Or are we really introducing a bias? <coughs> not clear what happens when you, when you add further symmetries, such as isotropy, etc., which is something that, uh, that, that we are working on, actually, that we are trying to, to understand. Um, Last time I uh, gave this talk, uh, Elan was here, so, uh, and she was uh, really uh, uh, bothering me about uh, the question of uh, supposing that the field uh, is a finite extension of the rationals. Uh, so, okay, her, her point was that this was the only uh, not physics inspired uh, postulate. Theorem. So, okay, I don't know about that, but it's true that it would be nice to have a theorem where you would say, um, you would say, well, let's just take the complex numbers, but assume that there is some imprecision when reading them out, and, uh, and, and try and get uh, computability out of that. To be more. Okay, so just a last sentence to conclude. Uh, so this question whether the charge ring thesis uh, uh, holds or not, okay, it's, it's hard to refute anyway. And uh, it's very dependent on the physical theory in which you put yourself. For instance, there are these uh, GR uh, inspired papers where you would do computable things with uh, black holes and so on. So, the point here is not to say that uh, the charge string thesis holds or it doesn't. The point is to take an uh, important hypothesis about the world, uh, homogeneity, uh, uh, etc. The charge string thesis is one of them. And the point is to try to see when it is the case that there is consistency or not within those important hypotheses about uh, the world. So uh, that's it. <coughs> Questions? So if you assume that space-time is not uh, arbitrarily divisible, uh, <coughs> can you uh, relax your assumptions about homogeneity of space-time? Or if you take some imprecisions in measurement, like 
Um, so if I can't cut space into pieces, uh, then I cannot provide the, the, the entire uh, proof relies on that. On the other hand, I don't really know how to say that I can't cut space into pieces. I mean, I, here I kind of like, like the formalism. More like, like you listed at the end, what would happen if I relax one of them? And so then you said, yeah, what, would happen if what would happen with my, my, can I find a counter example if I relax one of, of, of the accents? There was one slide with this. Yes. And on the top was uh, with uh, relaxing the <coughs> genetic space. Oh, the space. And then you show how you would uh, <coughs> uh, get the, in, uh, how would you compute the H function? Yes. So is it based on the fact that it's a, in, it's a continuous play space, uh, this possibility, and... No, that one no. isn't. Okay. Just, just say, uh, I still cut space into, into pieces, in, but uh, just in each cell, I'm saying that the dynamics is slightly different. Okay, so... But, but if space was finite, and you could only cut it into, you know, plank length chunks, yes. then you wouldn't. I mean, you assume that the universe is infinite as well. Yes. So Chesler saying, like, if space is finite and you could have another, then that would be it. Yes, that's true. If everything is finite, the church changes it as well. Because this seems to be a very strong assumption, mm -hmm. which we believe in. Okay, well, I think we should really. Talk more about this is costly.